Welcome to the Stepmom Side with Alicia Crasco, the podcast for stepmoms ready to create the life they want and one they actually have a say in. Here we talk all things stepmom life and just a little bit more. Leave the superficial conversations at the door and get ready for perspective shifts and actionable advice to help you on your way to creating the life you want. One step at a time. Hi, Carly. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm excited for you too, but my audience may or may not know you. So can you tell us who you are, why you do what you do? Give us all the information all about Carly. Yes, of course. Okay. So I am a women's empowerment coach. I work one-on-one with women who are ready to break free from people-pleasing patterns, perfectionism, good girl conditioning. Like that's my wheelhouse because I lived it for so many years. Um, And yeah, so that's, that's the primary thing is the one-on-one coaching, but outside of coaching, um, I'm a big Swifty. I love Taylor Swift. (laughs) I'm a divorced mom to two little girls. I've got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So it's nice and cold here right now, but I'm ready for spring to it's it's coming. It's coming. Uh, but yeah, I've been in the space of coaching, personal development, transformational kind of work for a really long time. Honestly, like my journey started over 10 years ago. Um, and I was deeply in it for a while, kind of stepped away, dove back in, um, right before COVID started kind of like November of 2019 and then really hardcore during COVID because there wasn't all that much else to do. (laughs) And uh, so I've been a student of the work for a few years now, really deeply, and been calling myself a coach for about like a year and a half, two years. And it's, uh, it's been super fun. Isn't it crazy? Because I feel like the same as you, like, okay, I've been coaching for a really long time, but like professionally, not as long as I feel like I've been doing it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Whether it's it's like, yeah, your friends or coworkers or, you know, like your family, whoever. And you're just like, okay, maybe I should just do this like for real. And like, <laughs> yes. oh, well. Okay. Yeah. So something that you touched on that I think people know, but don't really know is the good girl conditioning. Can you unravel that for us? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So like, how does it happen? Oh, well, I mean, it, in my opinion is that it basically happens like when you exit the womb and you're put into it's just so ubiquitous in our culture this like good girl like be a good girl be good and that it starts so young like even just the the language and the way in which we talk to little girls of like okay be a good girl like we're taught to be uh, like to be pleasing, to be appeasing, to be small and polite and make everybody else around us comfortable. Like it's just so ingrained that it wasn't even in my conscious awareness until, you know, well into my adulthood, into my thirties where I was like, wait a minute, like it's actually okay for me to, to have an opinion and to speak up and to disappoint people sometimes. Like God forbid. I know, right? Yeah. Right? Like, it's okay. And we're so like, there's so much around, like the the good girl is kind of like the the blanket of it, I think. But then like, well, you have to be a good mom and a good wife and a good this. And in order to do that, it's like, you're just kind of expected to sacrifice in some way, like lose yourself. Like when women talk about motherhood, especially the early years and like, it's hard. It's a full-time job and you just kind of lose yourself, your identity. At least that was very much my experience of it. And, but it's just, it's normal. Like it, I was never, anytime I did feel comfortable enough to kind of share those things, I was never like, okay, well let's like fix that or change that. Or why do you think that is? It was like, oh, that's just kind of how it goes. Like part of being a good fill in the blank for a woman, in my opinion, is putting yourself at the very bottom of the list. Like we take care of everybody else. And then hopefully, maybe if there's time and energy left over, we get to take care of ourselves. But in order to be good, we have to put others first. And to even think for a moment, like, well, what about me? I want to take care of me. It's so selfish. And why would you do that? And like, uh, they're just expected to sacrifice. And I just... 
I'm tired. I got tired of living that way. And I'm so committed to helping other women, if that's the path they want to choose to kind of shed that conditioning and unlearn it and interrupt those patterns so that they can just be themselves and take care of themselves because everyone benefits when you really pour into you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I think that like going back to the very beginning of what you said about like with little girls, like be a good girl. You know, you see people, I, I, cause I've seen this with my own daughter and it's, I now say something about the first time I heard it, because I understand, I know um, like the good girl conditioning is. And once I realized what it was, I was like, what the hell? Like, absolutely not. Like we are not doing that because I know the path that it takes you down. Right. Because same, like I did the same thing, but you know, we were leaving somewhere and somebody had said to my daughter, now be a good girl. And in my head, I'm like, and what the fuck is that supposed to mean? <laughs> what I'm like, right? right? Like, what is like, what does that mean? Because if you are leaving my house, I wouldn't say, hey, Carly, you know, be a good girl. You'd be like, <laughs> yeah, like, excuse what? me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so I, I'm very cognizant of like what I say to my daughter or the language that I use around her, even like pertaining to my own thing, because right, like they're sponges and they just mm-hmm. absorb everything, even if you're like, no, don't take that on. But it's just, what does that good girl mean? Like placate everyone. So it's easier for everyone else to move through life. And then you grow up and that's what you do. Like you said, like you just self-sacrifice whatever it is that you want to do. And yeah, in motherhood, so many people I know, and to a degree I did too, like you lose yourself. Like my daughter's almost five. And so I feel like I'm kind of coming out of it. But I remember when she was born, I thought I'm going to go back to work right away. Like I was very career driven, very like ambitious. Like I'm going back to work right right when my maternity leave was up at seven months. Like that's it. And then she was born and I was like, oh my gosh, she's so little. Like I can't just leave her. But it also needed something outside of her that was mine. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to start step mom coaching because I'm a step mom. And like, like I want to empower other step moms to do like their own thing too, and not be lost in it. And just like, this sucks. I hate this, but I've always had to do something outside of her. So I'm me because mm-hmm. I would lose my cool and just, I I can't be mom all the time or I can't be a wife all the time or I can't be a stepmom all the time. Like sometimes I just want to be Alicia. <laughs> like, yes. No. Yes. No, I love that. And it's, that's what like we as women can just, we lose sight of that, especially in the, the motherhood role. But I remember like, I just had, I was just having a conversation about this, like in thinking about motherhood and like my mom was a stay at home mom. So I was just kind of like, oh, I want to be a stay at home mom. Like it wasn't a conscious choice. It was just, this is what you do. And like, if there is that conscious, like I'm really going to pause and feel into what's true for me. And I want to stay home and like pour everything into being my mom and have that be like my quote unquote job, then, oh my gosh, like I will support you until like I'm blue in the face. Do that. But if that's not like, if that's just a box checking thing and like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I should do. Like that's, I think where the, the issues can come into play. And with the, the good girl stuff, and like, and, and working as a mom, like if yeah. I just, I had this story that I realized of like, okay, if I'm in a situation where I can stay home with my kids and I, but I choose not to, like, I need something outside of them, then I'm a bad mom. Like what kind of, like, these are the voices, right? Like what kind of monster wouldn't just want to spend all her time with her kids? Like what's wrong with me? I should do that because of all this conditioning I was fed of like, well, a good mom just puts herself last, does everything for the kids. Like loses herself ultimately that's not the language that we're fed but that's what happens Mm -hmm. so yeah it's just I think it's so important to and whether you're a mom or not to have things in your life that are for you and that's it not for anybody else not to meet expectations not to look good or be good just things that bring you joy and fulfillment it's so important oh my gosh yeah and so like you said like pouring from an empty cup if you are putting everyone else first At the end of the day, I was just, so in the stepmom's head community, like my own private community that I've got for stepmoms, we were talking yesterday about like the overwhelm and the overstimulation of having kids. And at the end of the day, the decision fatigue is real. (laughs) And I am sometimes touched out and I'm like, 
don't touch me. Actually, if you could just not even look at me, that would be really great too. But like, don't talk to me. I don't want any of it. And it's just one more thing that I have to do that feels like a chore and you're just maxed. And so I know when I like feel like that, that day I've done way too much for everyone else. And I didn't take a minute to just be like, okay, I'm going to sit here and literally stare at a wall. I will watch paint dry right now. That sounds like a great <laughs> idea. You know, and I used to be like, that's crazy. That's a weird thing to say. But now I'm like, I'm in. Like, <laughs> you know, let's do it together. <laughs> I'm not doing anything, right? Like, I don't have to do anything. Like, no one's expecting anything of me. And I can just, like, quiet my own mind and, like, be me and think about whatever it is. And maybe I'm sitting there scrolling or whatever. But I, we got to have a handle on that, too, because sometimes scrolling is not the answer. <laughs> yes, yes. There's so but many good moms. Oh my gosh. I know. Right. Like all like the highlight reels that yeah, you sure. see everywhere. And, uh, but I love though, like the awareness that you mentioned too, like, okay, if I get to the end of my day and I'm like, um, can you please not even breathe the same air as me? Like then I probably didn't take care of myself that day. And it's such good information to have, but, um, yeah, I really, I've noticed that too for, myself, I've actually, I just sent an email out about this to my, to my list about, about taking care of yourself. And I've done, I brag, I've done a really good job of that this month, mostly because January was such a shit show for me <laughs> in terms <laughs> of self-care. I was like, okay, this is not working anymore. I need to, to shift because I had, you know, I mean, I coach around people pleasing and perfectionism and good girl and all of that stuff. But I coach because I've been there. So I have those patterns. So just because I've made, I've done so much work around them, but they still creep back in sometimes I'm human. So it's not like I just, you know, snap my fingers and they're gone forever. And that was part of the problem was that I was, I saw that I was starting to like just let that creep back in and saying yes to things that I didn't really want to say yes to. And because I was worried about how I would look, I didn't want to appear as like someone who didn't care was God forbid selfish or something like that. And it just, it affected everything though. Like I wasn't showing up as fully in my business. I wasn't parenting in the way that I wanted to be parenting. I wasn't showing up as a great partner in my relationship. And it was because I wasn't taking care of me. So as challenging as it can be for someone like a, a woman, a mother who like just really doesn't have any kind of self-care like routines in place. And there's that moment of like, like eye rolling or like, well, it must be, must be nice for you, but I don't have time or I can't or whatever the voices that come up there are at the end of the day, it really like, you can't pour from an empty cup is a cliche for a reason. Like you can't show up fully for the people that you love if you're not showing up for yourself and you can't show up for yourself if you're constantly worried about being a good girl, pleasing other people, like making sure everything is perfect and getting it right all the time. It's exhausting. You don't have any energy left to pour into you. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. So to a completely different train of thought, but like, was there one specific incident or like a pivotal moment in your life that you were like, oh my God, I have been conditioned or, oh my God, I'm a people pleaser or I don't have any boundaries at all. Was there any like light bulb moment that like came on for you that just made you realize it? It wasn't so much like this, like line in the sand. Like I can pinpoint like the moment and the day that it happened. It was more of, for me inside of my marriage and just kind of this little voice started to come online of like, something just doesn't feel right. Something feels a little off, like what's going on. And from the outside looking in, like that made zero sense. There was no logical reason. Like it was, I had like, my husband was a wonderful man. We had a beautiful home. I had healthy kids. Like I had like the American dream, like poster was my life, but something felt off. And through a lot of the work that I've done, I kind of got to this place of, oh, I built this whole life that I thought that I wanted. And I, and to a degree, a part of me did, but mm -hmm. I did it based on meeting other people's expectations, checking all these other boxes. Like I never once in my life, quite literally never until uh, like my early thirties paused and was like, what do I want? Like, do yeah. I want this? And 
I got to the place of no, it was just, it was misaligned. It wasn't like this terrible, awful thing, but it just wasn't aligned to my, my truth. And so it was kind of, it was a gradual like awakening almost, but I was so concerned with keeping other people happy, meeting other people's expectations, checking their boxes that I went down a whole path and built a whole life based on what I thought that I should do because that's what I was seeing in the world. And I, that's what I was getting all of my, like, basically like my good girls for like all of my validation and praise and like all of these things of like, oh, you're just, you're doing so good. You're like, I mean, people weren't telling me you're being such a good girl, but that's yeah. essentially what it was. Yeah. And actually I was just like, no, actually like this, this isn't, I, I might be the goodest girl there is, but this isn't me. And I don't want this anymore. Yeah. It's wild how you go through life and not just like you, but like just in general, people go through life and they realize that you've been living your life based on what other people think you should be living your life as. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up and you're like, I, to a degree, I had that too, but not so much like in my marriage, but just like with my own family and rocking the boat, man. I remember like, I'm not going to rock the boat because what, what are people going to think? And then I was like, I'm, you know what? I'm not even going to rock the boat. Like, I'm just going to go ahead and capsize it. Like now let's see what happens. Right. <laughs> like, it's, Yeah. You just realize that you're living this life that from the outside looks great. And then when you really are honest with yourself, you're like, oh shit, like this isn't, I'm actually not happy. I don't like any of this. And I think that's the scary part. And so you did a marriage, which is like a bigger thing to sever, I think, than like your own family, because there's so many complexities that come in. So when you realized that you needed out or you wanted out, were you scared? Oh my gosh. I was terrified. I had, I tortured myself I'm sure, internally course. for months with this, like, cause it got, cause at first when it was quiet, like that little knowing was quiet, I could easily just dismiss it and like ignore it and tell it to go away. And then the that voice just kept getting louder and louder until I really couldn't ignore it. And the discomfort of capsizing the boat yeah. was eventually got to the point where that was less uncomfortable than staying where I was because I just knew it was misaligned and I just couldn't imagine living the rest of my life, even though it looked really good on the outside and had a lot of really good, beautiful parts. It wasn't actually my truth. And I was like, I can't live my whole, the rest of my life this way. And a huge so yeah, I was terrified. I was so scared to say the words out loud to my husband. I was terrified to tell people, especially my parents and my siblings, because my family loved him. And like, just like, I felt like I was letting everyone down, which is so normal. And I've, you know, I've learned through all of this, but you're a people pleaser, like when just taking care of yourself can feel like the world's ending because you're like, perceiving that you're letting everybody down and maybe you are disappointing people to an extent but we're all grown ups and we can take care of ourselves but um yeah it was so so hard but the thing that kind of like tip like that got me to to capsize the boat was thinking about my girls and that was it it ended up flipping for me because in the beginning that's what was like I can't do this I can't do this to them I can't break up this family like I I didn't want to. And then I eventually I got to the point of, well, what if they came to me as adults and they were feeling how I'm feeling? What would I tell them? I would never say, oh, well, suck it up and stay. Like you have kids, you have to stay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like just do it for the kids. Never. I would tell them to take care of themselves, to follow their own truth and joy and desire. And as soon as I really got that to click in my brain, I was like, okay. I know this is going to get so messy and it's going to be so worth it because I'm doing this for me, but I'm also doing it for them to show them that like, it's okay to change your mind. And it's really important to take care of yourself and follow your truth. And, and it's been, you know, it's, it's been a bumpy road, but we're all okay. And we'll continue to be okay. And yeah, I don't, I have zero regrets at all. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. It's, 
it is weird. Like divorce is weird. It does weird things to people's family. Like you said, like your family, you know, loves your ex-husband. I don't know if they still have a relationship with them, but then it's weird. Like if you repartner and it sounds like you have, like, what does that dynamic look like? These are rhetorical questions, but then like if he repartners and like, what does that dynamic look like? And then like, now you've got your family involved and his family involved and your partner's family involved and her, and it's just, it's so messy. Like Welcome to the blended family side. Yeah, this is so fun. (laughs) It's crazy. Like, it's wild to, like, be on this side of it, too, and all of the different dynamics at play. But something that you've touched on a couple of times that I want to go back to is the disappointing others, because Mm -hmm. that is something that I see my stepmoms struggle with so much is the people pleasing. I was a people pleaser forever. And then I was like burning bridges and like taking names, like whatever. I don't even care. I will help you with that. I will bring the gasoline and the torch, but it's hard to get past that point where you're like, if they're disappointed in me, like, what am I going to do? Like, like you said, like my world is ending because I'm going to stand up for myself and I'm going to take care of myself. So when you are with somebody and you're working them through, like, it's okay to disappoint people. Can you like walk us through? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, something that has always stuck with me from the first time I heard it was when you stop people pleasing, people are no longer pleased. Yeah. Like, wow. Duh. Right. Like it's such a simple that thing. Is so like, good. Yeah. It's so simple. It's it's so obvious, but it's so hard to be with, especially if you are a people pleaser. Like that's yeah. why we people please because we want people to be pleased and happy with us, and we want to keep the status quo and not rock the boat and all of the things. So. I think that is one of the first things that I really try to have conversations around is, you know, getting to the point of being okay with people being disappointed or upset or just, just not pleased. However, that shows up and teaching like, okay, like, like helping them learn how to hold the like sensation of all Mm -hmm. of that in your body, because that, again, like with the people pleasing, we, you want to just keep everybody else happy because in the short term, that's what feels good. That's Mm -hmm. like, it's safe and there's no conflict and everybody's happy. And you don't have all of this like anxiety essentially kind of building in your body, that tension, that like the knot in your stomach or your throat closing up or however it manifests in your body. So in the short term, people pleasing is great. Like that's why we do it. (laughs) <laughs> Short term payoff, but then long term, that's where like resentments will build because your boundaries are constantly being crossed by others or by yourself. And you just feel like not seen. You start to kind of lose yourself. Like it's all of like the long term effects of people pleasing are really like, can really compound over time and be really detrimental to, you know, your yourself, your own well being, and to your relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really just kind of getting that first part of like, okay, like this is so normal that when you stop people pleasing, people are going to be upset because they're used to you operating a certain way and now you're changing. So they've got to adjust to that and you, it's, you know, just kind of holding the, the boundary there for yourself. Um, and then also related to that, something that helped me make that easier is, acknowledging that, you know, I'm an adult, a sovereign being, I can take care of myself and my emotions. And I can trust that this other person can do the same thing. Because that's like the people pleasing, we're managing their emotions, right? Like you don't want them to feel sad or hurt or angry or anything like that. You want to protect them from it. But at the end of the day, they're just as they are capable of taking care of themselves. And to even take it a step further, like it is a disservice to them to not let them go through those emotions because you don't know where, like what that will get them to, what growth they will get from having to ride those emotions out and deal with all of that. If you're constantly protecting them from it all the time. So those are kind of like the like bullet points initially of like, okay, it's totally normal there that they are upset because you're not pleasing anymore. It's totally normal for it to feel like you're going to die when you do that. Yeah. And like, you can trust that they're okay. Like they're okay. You're okay. It's okay. Even if it doesn't feel that way in the moment, it's really like, it's okay. The first time is always the hardest. Mm -hmm. 
always. That's what I tell some moms too. Like it's okay for your partner to feel disappointed. It's okay for them to feel angry. It's okay for them to feel sad. It's okay for them to feel happy. Like emotions aren't good or bad. They're just emotions, right? Mm -hmm. It's how we express them that matters. And if you are enabling a certain kind of behavior because you're scared to say no or to stand up for yourself, <laughs> listen, I have been there too. And you're right. Like it feels good to do it because it's so much easier when everyone else likes us. And then when you like the very first time that you say no, or you stand up for yourself, yeah, you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> like I would <laughs> rather, I don't even know. Like there are so many things I would rather th do than say no. Like when I first started to like start taking my own thing back and it's, just here's something. I don't know if you coach people to do this too, but I'm like, practice what you're going to say and what you're going to do. Because then when that situation or that opportunity presents itself for you to go against the grain or do something different or, you know, do whatever it is that you actually want to do, it's that much easier because you just do it because you've been practicing it. Totally. And you're, but you're not going to be completely okay with it. You're still going to feel nervous. Your hands are going to be sweaty. You're still going to be like, Ugh. You still feel like you're going to die. Like all of these things. That's okay. It gets easier. It's just that first time is really hard. Yeah. Oh yeah. That first Band-Aid rip is like, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> and it, But yeah, but the, like to have some kind of, whether it's a script or like role playing or something like those are super helpful tools. And it's also important. And you touched on this too, of like, it's, you're still, you can practice all day long, but when it comes to like rubber meeting the road, it's still going to be scary and uncomfortable and probably messy because if you've never, if you have not practiced and strengthened that muscle of saying no, creating boundaries, holding boundaries, whatever it looks like, you're probably going to screw it up a little bit the first few times that you do it. So just knowing all of that going into it and having so much grace and compassion for yourself because you're, you're working a new muscle. You're doing something that you've never done or have very rarely done in the past. So of course you're not going to be like a master at it. That's why. So, so even treating it like a practice, not in this, like a frivolous, like, oh, this doesn't matter. It's just practice kind of way, but from a like practice makes progress, practice makes perfect kind of way, knowing I'm a beginner at this, so it's not going to come out right the first time, the first 10 times, the first 20 times. It takes a minute. Yeah. When, like you said at the beginning um, of this whole entire thing, not just this part where you still fall sometimes too, even though you coach people on this, like it's a muscle that you need to work. It's a muscle that you constantly need to flex in order for it to stay there, right? Like it needs to stay muscle memory. Even though I coach that moms through struggles too, like I still have my own struggles and it's not perfect. It's not like, oh, I'm a coach on this. I'm like so good at this all the time now. No, there are still hills that I die on or things that I'm like, why did you make that such a big deal? Like that really wasn't that big of a deal. Am I better at it now? Yeah, hundred percent. And like my recovery rate or my bounce back rate, whatever you'd like to call it is so much better now. It doesn't keep me down and out for days on end. But yeah, it's one of those things that, it gets better with practice because you are forced to use it if you actually want to like make the change and like do all of the things. And you've hit a lot on boundaries. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, sure. I think hmm, so many things you could say about boundaries. <laughs> um, <laughs> the most important thing I think for that is maybe less commonly said, like, I don't know is like boundaries really, they, they rest on you. This It's not about like, okay, I'm going to put up a boundary and you can't do this thing. Like, okay, yeah. that's a wall. Like you can do that. I mean, and honestly, like in the beginning, again, like it's messy. They probably will come out that way. I know that was very true for me. It's like, nope, you can't do this anymore. I'm like, okay, it's probably not going to be super well received first of all. And you can't control the other person. Exactly. Exactly. You are only in control of you. So the second that you start turning outward and trying to control anything outside of yourself, like the odds are very much against you that anything's going to work out that way. But if you create boundaries and you are the one who's upholding them, that's where all the power lies. Like it's all over here with you. And so it's super empowering in one hand. And like, it's also, it can be 
like a sobering moment almost when you realize like, oh, actually like these other people aren't crossing my boundaries. I'm the one crossing my boundaries or I'm letting them cross the boundaries. So like if it's, I don't know, like the, the way someone speaks to you or something like you can't do that. Like I refuse, you can't do that anymore. Well, you can't control them. They could keep doing it. And if you continue to let them, then you're the one who's letting your boundary be crossed. You're crossing it by not removing yourself from the situation by not like, you know, and again, it's some things are kind of a trial and error to kind of figure out what works. But I think the most powerful boundaries are the ones that aren't like those walls aren't necessarily super rigid, but to have a little bit of flexibility. Wait, so what? They you can't do that in a boundary. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like <gasps> a flexible boundary. What are you yeah. talking about? And I like that you're talking about this because when I started doing boundaries, I was like, I'm hundred percent going to enforce these. And I made a list of like 800 of them. Do you know how exhausting that is to try to enforce 800 boundaries? Mm -hmm. But damn it, I'm going to show you that you are not going to cross my boundaries. I like, look, look at all these ones that I have. And then I, at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Right. right. It is. You can't enforce it's all of them. Less is more. No. And then also now I, I do, I don't know, like 80, 20, 90, 10. I don't know. I don't enforce every single one of them all of the time. Yeah. If you can believe yeah. that. <laughs> what? You're I not know. doing it right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but like, that's what people think, right? Like it doesn't, it has to, I think that's so beautiful because there is like, just life is not this like constant thing like it's flowing and ebbing all the time so like I I don't think in this you know maybe unpopular opinion but like I don't think your boundaries need to be crazy rigid I think they can flow and ebb and kind of be dependent on what the situation the person the day whatever it is um and it is it's a lot less energetically taxing to be mm -hmm. able to flow with it and all that to say it's so common because you just spoke to it. I've done it myself. Like if you are over here and you have zero boundaries and you're like, okay, you know what? I'm done living here. You swing all the way to the other side. <laughs> like I'm having all the boundaries for everything and no one's going to break any of them. Like both of these places are challenging to live in for different reasons. So it's that learning curve and kind of figuring out, okay, where is my sweet spot with my boundaries and what that looks like and stuff. But but yeah, so I think a little bit of flexibility is a good thing. And ultimately it really, it's, I think the first misstep, misstep people make is being like, okay, you can't do this and you can't do that. And these are my boundaries when in reality, your finger needs to be over here with you and be like, okay, what am I available for? What am I okay with? How do I uphold these? And that's where like coaches and spaces like containers are really great because you can go out into your life and practice these things and try these things and then come back and be like, okay, I did this thing and this didn't work. And what are you seeing that I'm not seeing? And just have like an objective person to help you navigate this like totally new arena that you're in. If you've never been a boundaries person before. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this, since we're talking about it, do you find that when you're working with women about setting boundaries that they go from zero to like a hundred and then they swing back to like the middle and they kind of like balance out? that's been the most common thing I've seen. It's not like you have to do it that way. In fact, like if you're listening to this, maybe this will help you avoid like the hardcore yeah. pendulum swing. But a lot of it is, it's so common just because you, because everyone pendulum, everyone's pendulum swings a little differently. So you don't really know what's too much or too little for you until you're willing to, you know, kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see yeah. what sticks. So I think I mean, I won't say like, yes, it happens with everyone, but I think it kind of, it just looks a little different, but yes, I think with most people it's, you know, you got to calibrate a little bit yeah. before you get to balance. That's what I see though too. And I'm like, maybe it's the, the stepmoms that I attract, like they're a lot like me, like very like driven and ambitious and black and white and there's absolutely no gray area. And then you've got to like learn to like work in the gray. Right. But like you said, there's a lot of trial and error because you and I could sit here, if we were on a coaching call, you and I could sit here all day and talk about boundaries and you could be like, oh my gosh, Alicia, I'm so good. Or I could say, you know what, Carly, I'm so good. I've got this. Now let me go in the real world and see how it works <laughs> and actually see what, see what happens, right? But when you 
go out and you realize that, yeah, you are in that black and white area and I'm going to do this a hundred percent of the time because they absolutely it's all or nothing. And I think that's another part that people really fall on their face about. I did a hundred percent. I totally did because it was right is right and wrong is wrong. And there's no, like, there's no compromising at all. Like so much so that I like put it in our wedding vows, like with my husband, like it's the first relationship that I've ever compromised in, but <laughs> it's learning to work in that gray area and giving yourself, like you had said, giving yourself the grace to try to just figure it out. Like this is something new for you. Like you've got to learn it. And so if you're listening to this and you're multitasking, come back to us. <laughs> like This is something that you need to know. Um, just give yourself some grace to just figure it out and mm -hmm. try something different because what you've been doing isn't working. So I'm, you know, we're happy that you're trying something different, but expect to get it wrong or expect it to not go perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. Like just go back and listen to that part again. <laughs> <laughs> or like you had said, like when you stop people pleasing, people are no longer pleased. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be okay. Like the disappointment. Yeah. Okay. So that leads perfectly into perfectionism. Hmm. Oh God, that perfectionism. It's mm. wonderful, right? Isn't it? I mean, I don't know. I've never experienced it, but if I had it, <laughs> it's really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, no, my uh, nickname like through high school and growing up was Miss Perfect. So mm. yeah, perfectionism had its claws nice and deep in me. That's yeah, been such a good girl. Oh my gosh. I told the goodest, the goodest girl. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Perfectionist. You always know that you were like a perfectionist. Yes. Like, like your identity? I mean, through school and stuff like that. Like I was very much a perfectionist and um, I, I knew that I was, I didn't see how harmful it was and how much it was keeping me from like living my life fully and like really being myself. I had created this perfect version of me or what I thought was or closest to perfect, you know? And uh, it was just consuming to try to be perfect. And I'm also like, I was very much like the achiever type and like, I just like the circumstances of my life and upbringing and personality like it was like the perfect storm to just create like miss perfect and it was speaking of exhausting it was absolutely exhausting to try and create this this thing that doesn't even exist perfection is not real it is not attainable it's not a real thing and yet we're fed that especially as women in so many ways that perfection is possible and then we kill ourselves trying to get there and I just, I was sick and tired of trying to be perfect, but yeah, that's definitely been the hardest one for me to shake for sure. That one comes up the most for me and I have to be like, okay, like my perfectionist is back. Like let's, she's trying to drive the bus again. She needs to go to the back of the bus. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I like that you're aware of it because yeah, same it's, it is exhausting. Mm-hmm. You can kill yourself trying to be perfect, but you, at the end of the day, you're still not going to be perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. And then like the anxiety of what if I make a mistake and people find out or what world. if, like we talked about, you know, like about, I'm um, creating a podcast earlier to like not go off of this, but like before we started recording, but same thing, I was like, oh my gosh, what if it's not perfect? What if it's not like insert whoever's podcast, right? That's got like a production team and like does all the things. And then I was like, you know what? Here's a spaghetti. Like, let me just throw it. And what, I don't even care. Like whatever, <laughs> like it's, it's done. Right. And it's a resource that people get to have. And I love it. It's the easiest thing, but it's just outside of a podcast, like shaking the perfectionism tendencies is really hard because yeah. What if people see you making a mistake? So I can only imagine the anxiety that you felt about being like, hey, we need to get a divorce. Yeah. Oh my God. I like the thought of like, as scary as it was to say that to my husband, the, the most important person involved in the situation, if I'm being really honest, like some of like the, some of the uglier side of it for me to admit is that like, 
there was almost just as much, if not more fear around what all the other people were going to think of me because I had built this perfect life. And that, that was like my brand kind of, right. I was like setting my brand on fire and it's like, oh my God, what is everyone going to think? Like they're going to like X, Y, Z, all of these things. I'm a terrible wife. I'm, I, I just used him. I'm, I'm an awful mother. I like just, I had like no shortage of voices in my head telling me how terrible I was. Uh, but it it just, again, like it just got to the point of this just isn't sustainable. It's not actually working for me to try and to keep this perfect mask on. And it was, it was making connection with others, like true, deep, intimate, vulnerable connection, like impossible because vulnerability and all of that, that's, it's inherently messy and scary and imperfect. Mm -hmm. So I like didn't have any of that. Like I didn't have deep relationships with really anyone in my life because I kept everyone at like an arm's length because that's where my perfectionist mask was. Uh, and I was really like uh, something that I had learned through my whole journey. It was like, I just, I crave that. Like as humans, we crave that connection. We were social creatures. And, and I mean, I was, I was not like I wasn't social. I wasn't in isolation all the time, but I wasn't, that need wasn't being deeply, truly met because I was the one not letting it be met. And it, I was just tired of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I could have said the exact same thing. Yeah. I get it. Where you're like, it's funny because one of my really good girlfriends from college said something to me once that really got me to like, see it. She said, Alicia, you're really good at letting people feel like they know you and they're like in, but they have no idea who who you are. Mm. And I was like, that's not true. (laughs) (laughs) And she was like, really? Just watch. I'm like, um, and then I realized, yeah, same thing. Like it was the wall because yeah, you want that connection, but also there's, and I, I didn't have a great childhood. Like I didn't have a great upbringing. Like we didn't have money. Like, any, so I don't like those perfectionism tendencies. I felt like were to hide that part of it. And so if you really got to know me, then you would know that my parents are divorced. Oh my God, the horror. Right. But like, my dad wasn't around or my mom was a single mom and worked a ton or you know, just like a bunch of different things. And then as an adult, like, I don't, obviously I don't care because I just told you. Right. But <laughs> it's just that connection of like, Oh, we have similar experiences or, you know, we've gone through like shared different things and you just learn to not live behind that mask. And now I'm at the point of like, I would rather you hate me for who I am than love me for somebody that I'm not because that's exhausting to maintain. And what you see is what you get. Like, that's it. The end. Yeah. 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 The perfectionism. I see you. Yeah. Mm. Though I love that. It's so, it's so to finally, to get to the point where okay, this is, this is who I am. This is, this is what you get. It's so, it's terrifying to Mm -hmm. get there, but oh my God, it's so freeing to just be like, okay, like this is me. And I, and so much of it, like, I mean, and you just kind of spoke to it. I know you didn't use this word, but like perfectionism is so tied to shame. Like we are operating inside of this perfectionist, like perfectionism tendencies. There's something that we're ashamed of that we're trying to cover up or hide from people because we think if they see this part, they won't whatever, love me, approve of me, they'll leave whatever like the, the wounding is there. Um, and so to be able, and the only way that shame dies is by bringing it out into the light. So you have to like, like shame and perfection, like it just can't, it can't all coexist. So as soon as you start saying those things and that's where, and we talked a little bit about this, I think before we started to record, but like, we think sometimes that we are the only ones struggling with this, some issue or insecurity or thing going on. And so we hide it because we're ashamed of it. But then as soon as you share it, that's where that connection comes back in. And people are like, oh my God, me too. Or I've had this experience. And then you start to feel less and less alone. You're less worried about being 
perfect. You have less shame around the thing. You're getting this connection. Like it's just, again, like that first step is so hard, like shaky feet, like, will my foot hit the ground without me dying? Like that kind of fear. But once you do it, it's like, I can, I, I just can feel the relief in my body. Now I've been thinking about it. Like, it's just so like freeing. I know I said that already, but it's just so freeing to just be able to be yourself. And what is possible through that is so worth all of the fear and the struggle and the discomfort to get to that place. Yeah. Okay. So when you work with women that are experiencing that and they are scared, how do you talk them through that? Hmm. It takes a while. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's not a, gosh, I wish it were like a one conversation kind of thing. That would be great for everybody. Right. But it's not, it's, I mean, I've been doing work for years and it still is something that I have to come back to and revisit because things will show up in different ways. I'm like, okay, another thing to look at, like, let's dig in. Um, but yeah, it's really, I think, I mean, I, I like to use a lot of questions and just getting in there with her (laughs) (laughs) because I know like, I mean, yeah, I've, I've gone through programs. I've had my own experiences. I've had trainings and stuff, but I don't know you best, you know, you best, and you know what you need best, even if you might not be able to access it right now. Like if you don't, you might not think, you know, the answer, but it's in there with you somewhere. And that's my job is to ask the questions to help get there, to shine the light on what needs to be brought out. Um, But I, I find often, and this has been my experience personally of like, it often goes back to like how you just mentioned childhood, like there are things that happen in our childhood. And if you have ever worked with a coach or like a therapist, I'm sure you're you're familiar, like everybody goes back and does the inner child work, which I remember when I first, I mean, I feel like that is maybe not super well known, but like people are familiar enough with like what that may or may not be. And I avoided it for a while. Like I didn't want to, because I just, I knew I was like, this is where like, some of the like sticky stuff is that I don't want to deal with, but that's, if I want to get the results now in my adult life and my present life, like I've got to go back and see like, okay, what happened when I was little? Like, what does this little version of me, my little girl, what does she need to say? What does she need to know? Like, and a lot of it is, it's very, you know, I mean, it for lack of better words, like it can feel a little like woo woo, like, oh, I'm going back. I'm like, I, I'm talking to parts of myself. Like, what are you talking about? But it is that has been some of the most healing things for me to just be with myself and like be held like with someone kind of guiding that. I mean, and you can totally do it alone. I have too, but to just feel safe in someone else's presence to really tune inward and let that part of me come online and say certain things or hear certain things or whatever, because it's all, everything's rooted way back in childhood. Like the good, the bad, the ugly, it all started in those like formative years. So I think that like lots of questions and then kind of having those questions centered around like getting to the root of whatever's going on, because generally like, you know, if it's hysterical, if there's like big things happening, it's historical. There's something rooted in the past that needs to be looked at. And then once you get the awareness, it doesn't necessarily make the thing go away, but now, you know, this is where it came from. And sometimes like I literally, I can feel sometimes where like, if I have a big reaction to something where I'm like, like, kind of like, like, why did I react like that? What's going on? Like it wasn't, me, it was this younger part of me that got touched on and triggered. And I can be like, oh yeah. Okay. Like reassure this part of myself, bring my adult woman back online into the driver's seat and, and go from there. But yeah, lots of, lots of questions and inner child work. (laughs) Yeah. And something I just thought of, I didn't even, I've never thought of it like this, but I think the scary part, cause you said it was, it's scary to like go back to that. Right. And I think the I can't even believe I never thought this, but like the scary part of it is the shame of going back. Like maybe you had the perfect childhood. So like, how can my parents have done anything wrong? 
I had the perfect childhood. Right. And then, so now like in your own head, obviously people can't read your thoughts, but it feels like it, it feels like everyone knows that you're like, well, you were a terrible mom air quotes because of whatever, or these are things that you did that, you know, whatever, even though your own, your own thoughts that you're like working through, it feels like it's like tattooed on your forehead and everyone can see it. And that is scary. And it feels shameful to go back with an adult perspective and be like, you know what, actually I did need this or I needed that, or I didn't need this, or I didn't need that. And that vulnerability piece because of like the perfection, there's so many things that are intertwined. And I love that you talked about like going back to your childhood, because I feel like a lot of the times it's, I'm working with confidence or I'm working on self-esteem building with stepmoms that I'm coaching because there's like, that's just like been swept out from under them for whatever reason, right. Whether it's childhood or their current situation, but it always like ties ties back to that. But I'm like, Oh yeah, that's why it's so messy to go back to like your childhood because there's so many other like outside factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never even like thought about that till just now. That's so wild. Yeah, no, it's so, it's such a good point though. Like whether like going back can be challenging because if you did have a difficult childhood, like that's an uncomfortable, like I would imagine you're happy to be out of that place. You don't want to go back into discomfort and difficulties. And on the opposite side of it, if you've had a, you know, a a good childhood that like picture perfect thing again, or even not picture perfect, but just like good, like no big capital T traumas or anything, then it's like, well, if I go back, like what's going to happen? Am I going to ruin like all these good memories that I have? Am I going to cause issues with my parents now? Like, am I like just it can sometimes feel like a Pandora's box almost of like, what am I going to get? It's all unknown. And the unknown is scary. It's just, that's our experience as humans, but it's so important. Like to move forward, sometimes you just have to go backward. Like you can't, we get a little stuck without being willing to, you know, kind of go down into the basement and like look through old boxes and memories and stuff and, and figure out like where the root of it all is. Yeah. You're so right. The uncertainties and the unknowns are, they feel like the death of you Mm because I don't, yeah, every, I mean, I felt like that too, like as a stepmom, but like sometimes I coach, they're like, it's just the unknown of like, what's going to happen. Like, you know, we could be out like on an anniversary date and like get a phone call or a text or a last minute schedule change or whatever the case may be. And I'm like, you can what if everything. Mm-hmm. You can what if anything, everything. You are going to give yourself a heart attack. <laughs> it's just like, so it can make you so crazy. But oh my gosh, this has been so good, Carly. Where can everyone find you? What do you have for them? Like, tell us everything. I'm like, ah, I want to, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, this has, this has been amazing. I'm so glad that we got to connect. Um, okay. I, so like I said, one-on-one coaching is like my primary offer. That's it right now. So you can get in touch with me. I've got a website. It's my name, carlyweisert.com. Super easy. Um, and then my Instagram handle is the same. It's just my name. Uh, you can DM me there and I have, uh, in my link there and we can, I'm sure we can link it here too. I created a, uh, an e-workbook. It's the ABCs of transformation. So it's this kind of like tongue in cheek workbook where it goes through the whole alphabet and it has definitions for all these different words that you might hear thrown around in the coaching world. Some things that some words we use today, and then little journal prompts and exercises to kind of work through different things. And that's a free download. You can get through my Instagram or linked here. But uh, yeah, those, those are the big things, the coaching, and then just following me on Instagram and that free ebook. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. This has been so good. You are such a wealth of knowledge. This is amazing. Thank you so much. This was, I'm just thrilled that this happened. I love talking about this stuff. I love connecting with like-minded women and I'm super excited about what's to come. Perfect. We'll have to have you back. I would love that. Thanks for taking time to listen to this week's episode. If anything was helpful or resonated with you, please share it on social media and tag me. I'm just at Alicia Crosco. And if you could leave a five-star rating and review while you're at it, that would also be really helpful. And if you find yourself struggling with your stepmom journey and you want a little bit more support without the hefty price tag of coaching, you might want to check out 
the stepmom side community, which is my own private community for stepmoms, where you get to connect with other stepmoms around the world and myself, where I hold weekly office hours and monthly group coaching. It's kind of like you have your own personal coach in your own back pocket. Again, without that hefty price tag. See you next week. Thank you.